We're in Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 4. Jesus' ministry is well underway. People are amazed at the things that he says, but also at the things that he does. In chapter 12, verse 4, we're going to cover just verses 4 through 7 this morning because I just couldn't get any farther. Uh, I just could not see. I'd keep you here two hours if I went any further than this. So, um, chapter 12, verse 4, Jesus says, And I say to you, my friends, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. Now, he's addressing his friends. I say to you, my friends. He is still talking to his disciples. Last week, the first three verses that we covered, he turned his talk from rebuking the Pharisees, he turned to his disciples. And, uh, and he was warning his disciples, don't be like the Pharisees, and in particular, don't be hypocrites, because the Pharisees were all worried about the outside, and they didn't take care of what was going on in the inside. Hypocrites are people who pretend to be one thing, but inside there's something else. They might look like people who are extra close to God, but inside they are wicked, unrepentant, unrepentant sinners. They don't want to change. He says... I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that do have no more that they can do. They kill the body and no more that, no more they can do. Now, it's not going to be too long after Jesus' resurrection that the disciples will begin to experience persecution. In the first 300 years of Christianity, it's at least in the hundreds of thousands of Christians that will be put to death. I've seen some statistics that puts it into the millions. One researcher has documented that over the last 2,000 years, over 70 million have died for their faith. Today, if you travel, if you as a believer travel to Syria or to Iraq and you get captured by those fellows wearing black, you will get to join that number. Because persecution is nothing new. Now, if another person has the ability to kill your body, is that the worst they can do? That's what Jesus is challenging. He says, don't be afraid of those who all they can do is kill your body, and that's all they can do, because there's something worse than physical death. Verse 5, he says, I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Power to cast into hell. I want to talk about the word hell for a few minutes. The Greek word here in the text, the Greek word is geena. It, it's, it's, even though this is Greek, it actually is coming straight from a Hebrew phrase, which means literally the valley of Hinnom, and that's actually the shortened form because the, sh- the full form in the Old Testament is the valley of the son of Hinnom or Ge Ben Hinnom is the full Hebrew form. And originally this term actually uh, talked about a specific place, a specific val- a valley. It's south of Jerusalem. If we zoom in on Jerusalem, um, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll highlight this this, that's the city of Jerusalem in Jesus' day. The city under David's day is a little bit further south. That's the ancient city of David. Off to the left, to the west, this is Mount Zion proper. And just south of Mount Zion is this valley that runs east and west, Gehenna. It intersects here with the valley of Kidron, the Kidron Valley. Um, what's interesting is that today, if you get out the road map, there is, a, there is a road that runs right, right down the middle of the valley, and the name of the, va- the, name of the street, in Hebrew, it's, it's right, on, right on Google Maps, is Ge Ben Hinnom, the valley of the son of Hinnom. They know what the valley is. Now, how would you like to have your business address <laughs> at, in Gehenna? <laughs> or next time your friend says, oh, go to hell, you say, well, I live there. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, sorry. Little Bible humor. Ahaz was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah, and he was a bad guy. 
He was the first one to bring a wicked connotation to this valley. Second Chronicles 28.3, it says, He burned incense in, there it is, the valley of the son of Hinnom, uh, Gay ben Hinnom, and he burned his children in the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Ahaz practiced the worship of Molech. And the way Molech was worshipped, that's Molech here. He is a, a statue made out of metal. They would burn a fire inside underneath him. And when his arms got red hot, glowing from the heat, they would take a baby, would put a mask on the baby so the parents can't see the baby's face. They would beat the drums loudly so you can't hear the baby screaming and they would put a live baby on these red hot metal arms giving the child to Molech. A king of the south, king of Judah, Ahaz, did this. His grandson, Manasseh, would do the same thing, Second Chronicles chapter 33. The prophet Jeremiah rebuked the nation for this evil. He wrote, and they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my heart. God says, what in the world are you thinking of? This is not from me. It says they built Tophet, a place called Tophet. It's interesting because this, this week, one of my news feeds um, had an archaeologist writing an, an article about Tophet. And I thought, was like, wow, that's like, that's freaky that I'm doing this, that I'm doing this today. Um, Tophet is a, uh, um, oh, it's, a Phoen it's Phoenician. It's from the Phoenicians, uh, Tyre and Sidon. They spread all around the Mediterranean, um, the worship of Baal. And they used this term Tophet. Tophet comes from the Hebrew, which means drums because of the drums that they would, they would uh, uh, make noise with to drown out the babies. Now perhaps in response to Jeremiah's rebuke, when J King Josiah begins his great reforms in the nation, it says that he defiled Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire to Molech. Um, Josiah removed the idols. And the place became a city garbage dump. And they would keep the fires burning there night and day to burn the garbage, to burn animal carcasses, to burn if there was a dead body that nobody claimed and, and they didn't know what else to do with it, they'd throw it on the fires of, the, of Gay Ben Hinnom. And this place, Ben Hinnom, or, or Gehenna, would be the ideal picture of what we today call hell. And that's where the term comes from, hell. Jesus said, don't fear the ones who can kill your body and that's all they can do. You need to fear him who has the power, the authority to, ca to kill you and cast you into hell. Somebody has this authority and don't get confused. This is not Satan. Satan doesn't have this authority. He does not have this authority. The one that Jesus is talking about is God. God is the only one who has this authority. And though God will send people to hell, keep in mind that hell was not originally created for mankind. It was created for someone else. Jesus said that uh, hell is the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, as mentioned first service, as believers, we will receive a new body one day. And our new body, our glorified body, will be just perfect for enjoying heaven. In fact, you need the new body to enjoy heaven because the Bible says flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God because if you go to heaven right now in this body, you're just like, <laughs> blow up or something. You know, it just could not take it, could not take it. So God's designed a new body for you, just like a space suit, you know. It can handle space. Well, you'll be able to handle heaven with your new body. The unbelievers will also get a new body. And their body, like our new body, will last forever. Their new body, unlike ours, is not designed for heaven, but is designed for an eternity 
in the everlasting fire. Hell doesn't last for a few minutes until the soul burns up. The soul does not burn up. It is forever. It is forever. So let's talk for a minute about heaven or hell. Why does God send people to hell? Well, see, the problem, friends, is because of our sin, our rebellion against God. Paul wrote that the wages of sin is death. If you go to work at Sin Incorporated, you'll get a paycheck at the end of the week. And your paycheck says, pay the amount of death, separation from God, ultimate separation from God, translated hell. This is the result, this is the consequence of our sin. Now, the problem is, some of us don't quite buy that. Because some of us think, well, you know, my sin isn't all that bad. All i got to tell you is this. You don't have a clue how bad your sin is. In the sight of a holy, pure, all-powerful creator who made you. The, the proper penalty for all of our sin is death. God isn't exaggerating. This is the consequence of sin. And our God is a just God. He believes in justice. That's part of his nature. Now, actually, whether we want to agree with it or not, we kind of usually like justice, don't we? I mean, that's what the Rambo movies are all about, right? Because a bad guy gets away with something, and then Rambo gets unleashed, and he, and he kills all the bad guys. They get their due, right? 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 You know, that's what John McClane does, you know, in the, in the Die Hard movies. The bad guy, the evil terrorist, you know, wants to take over, and, and, and John McClane shows up, and he somehow makes it, you know, and, and we like seeing bad guys get their due. You hate it, don't you? When, a, when somebody that's obviously bad gets away with something? Don't you, don't you hate it when somebody, you know, has, has, has killed five people and they get out in two months after, you know, going to prison for two months? Doesn't that just make, burn you up, right? Right? Does it? Yeah. Can I hear some amens? Yeah. Let's wake up, gang. Can I hear some amens? Yeah. Can I hear some preacher brothers? Yeah. Well, see, the problem with this is that you and I are also sinners. That's where we don't like the justice so, so much. Mercy I like. Justice for you, mercy for me. That's kind of the way we live our lives, you know. I, I, want, I want mercy, but, but God is just across the board. And God will deal with sin. Well, God has a solution to the problem. Because to be honest, God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. 2 Peter 3.9 says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want people to go to hell. That's why he did the ultimate, he sent his son to die in our place. God, eternal, immortal, all-powerful God, took on human flesh. And when he died on the cross, he laid down an immortal, eternal life and paid enough to cover all of our sins. That's how much God loves you. And God offers forgiveness to anyone because he has paid the price. And he did all of this because he loves you. For God so loved the world. Read it with me. That he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the only way you will go to, have, to, go to hell is if you reject God's payment for your sin if you reject Jesus Christ, if you reject God's one way. See, the, Jesus is the way because he's the only one that paid. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Why, is that because he's stuck up? Is that because he's narrow-minded? No, it's because he knows that he's the only one who could and did pay the price. That's why God's so narrow-minded. It's because God had one way. This is it. This is the bridge across the, the great chasm. This is it. Take the bridge. And the only way you're going to go to hell is if you reject God's one way. Now, and I know I probably, if my mother was still alive, she probably would not like me using language like this. But if you reject Jesus, I just can't help but think that you're an idiot. See, I'm not supposed to use that word. That's probably not a church word, an idiot. 
But why would you do that? Why would you do that? A God who loves you so much, why would you say no to him? Figuring out how to get right with God and to stay right with God is what the fear of God is all about. Figure this out. God wants you to trust him. And at, at the end of the service, I will give you a chance to do that. I'll give you a chance. This is what the fear of God is. I know what God could do, and I will respect him, and I will take his loving, merciful way out. I will receive his grace. That's what God wants. Now, in talking about this, there is another lesson here about fearing the one who has power to cast into hell, and that's the opposite end to talk about the fear of people, because that's what Jesus is warning us not to fear. Don't fear people who can just kill your body. Watching out about fear of people. Now, we get into trouble because we fear, sometimes we just fear the wrong things. And um, we're afraid of all kinds of things. Some people, I hear, are even afraid of birds. I don't get that. I have a video, so this is the only time, Steve, you can... uh, Turn the lights out, but we'll, we'll uh, uh, this is, okay. Okay, we're going to have to get the sound going. Um, so tell me when. You ready, Frank? Okay, let's try this again. They're kind of like dinosaurs, but not in a good way, just in a, in a, in a terrifying way, like they could revert at any time. <laughs> I don't like birds, whether they're small or big or whatever they're doing. If they're just sitting there or flying, I do not like them at all. I have immediate fear of them. The weird feet. I'm kind of scared that they're going to just attack every single human being. There is a surprise element to this video. Please don't bring in a bird. Oh, love that noise. Is it in front of my face? Not yet. Well, not yet. Open your eyes. You can do it. <laughs> oh <my> ah! <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh god, there are two of them. Oh my god. It's, they're so yellow. Hey. 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> You're so cute. I'm so not scared of these ones. I'm your mother now. Oh my god, look at the little wings. Oh, it's bugs. Is it soft? As long as I look at it this way, and I can't see his eyes or his beak or his claws, he's super cute. It's kind of awkward though, because I feel I've eaten a lot of these and it's really bad. I'm like, sorry. It's true, people eat ducks. But you don't have to eat ducks. Dude, I'm really sorry. I never thought I'll see you eye to eye. Oh, that noise. It's a little whiffle noise. I can look at it and I can appreciate its cuteness. <laughs> but I can't carry it. <laughs> no. <laughs> I feel like a good duck mother. I feel like a horrible duck father. This doesn't count as a bird. It's not flapping in my face. It's not pooing on my car. This is the best surprise that I think I've ever had. His eyes are still really freaking me out when I look at them. Yeah, I like birds. They're cool. See, these are what raptors became. <laughs> if they were bigger, oh my God, chill, buddy. they would eat me. This does not change how I feel about birds at all. Hi, I'm just a little bit freaked out. I definitely like birds a lot more after today. After looking at a duck in the eyes, I'm gonna try not to eat duck now. I hate birds. Like fluffy things. I love ducks. I just wanna be a duck queen and just be surrounded by ducks for the rest of my life, to be honest. I'm sorry, I don't get the, the fear of birds thing, but that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. Um, sometimes our fear of the wrong kinds of things can cause us to do silly things. When we are afraid of people, we will tend to do things that aren't too healthy. 
Sometimes we want to avoid conflicts with people because we're afraid of what will happen if we talk to them about a problem. We, we got this fear thing driving us. Sometimes we put on masks and we pretend to be something we're not, just like the Pharisees. See, this all ties to the Pharisees as well. Jesus warned his disciples about hypocrisy. And I think one of the reasons we become hypocrites is we're afraid to let people see what's really inside. If I'm honest, you might not like me. So I'll pretend to be something else. Fear. Sometimes we're afraid to stand up for what we believe and to share our faith. And we'll talk about that next week. So we're afraid that we're going to harm a relationship that we consider important. Jesus taught us that the way to deal with your fear of people is to first fix your fear of God. Get the fear of God down first. Figure out your relationship with God first. For some of you, that, and that means facing the reality of heaven and hell. And it starts, it starts by trusting Him and realizing who God is. That's where it starts. And for some of you, it's not about the fear of God as, as much as it, as it is the love for God that you need to get straight. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me. David wrote, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In reality, when you get things right with God, you don't need to be afraid of anyone else. That's easy to say. It's hard to do. He says, verse 6, Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Now, in Jesus' day, you could walk into the marketplace and you could buy birds. You could buy, you could buy five little birds. They would look just like that. And you could buy them for two copper coins. And I don't think that it would be two pennies. And in our day, it would be about $10 is about the, the, what, what the equivalent would be. But it's still a pretty good deal. You know, five birds for two, for two bucks. Five Tweety birds for 10 bucks. I mean, that's pretty good. You know, it's like two bucks a piece, you know. And sparrows might not be worth too much in our eyes. And yet not one of them, not one of them is forgotten by God. Not one of them is forgotten. I want to talk about this not being forgotten. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you were forgotten? Um, Noah and his family had spent six months on the ark already. Flooded conditions. All these animals. Probably a lot of poop. You know, a lot of, a lot of mess to clean up. I mean, you think about it. I mean, it just, it would be a mess. Six months, no end in sight. I can't, I would imagine if I was, if I was Noah, I'm beginning to wonder if God had forgotten. What's the point of this, of, of all of this? No dry land. Rome, Genesis 8.1 says, then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark and God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters subsided. God reminded Noah that he hadn't forgot him. But I got to tell you, it was still six more months before they disembarked. Still six more months. Not forgotten. I remember after I graduated from seminary, um, our direction in life began to change. Um, I had grown up in the Baptist church. Um, I went to seminary. I went to college into seminary thinking that I would be a Baptist pastor because that's what Baptists do. But by the time uh, seminary had finished, our pastor had left the church, and I really wasn't real excited about the, the Baptist denomination at the time. Um, I had connections. I had really good connections in our church, but I wasn't really all that thrilled to be a Baptist. And, uh, and so Deb and I prayed. We thought about it. We, tr we went down all different avenues, and we decided we would just throw everything to the wind and go for the gold and just do the best thing that we wanted to do, the thing that was closest to our heart in ministry, and that was to become a part of the Calvary Chapel movement. Um, I'd always loved the way that God worked through Calvary Chapel. Uh, when I was, I was a youth pastor for six years, a senior high youth pastor, and I used to run my 
my senior high youth group like a little Calvary Chapel. It was just no different than going to going to Calvary Chapel, coming to our youth group. And so I thought, well, I might as well just do the real thing, you know. But that meant, that meant throwing out all of my connections. That meant throwing out all my education to the wind because Calvary Chapel doesn't seem to pay too much attention to education. At the time, they didn't. And, uh, and it meant that I needed to get a job because I was only earning, I think it was like 600 a month, was it? Something like that. I was a part-time senior high youth pastor. I, that that, that kind of had to stop. And, uh, and besides, um, Pastor Romaine told me at, at Calvary Chapel, he said, you need to go get a job. It's like, what? A job? <laughs> a real job. And this was in the early 1980s. This was um, at the height of what we called the Reagan Recession, when there were more people out of work than anything, and it was very hard to get a job. And I remember uh, putting in a lot of applications, getting my resume done, putting in applications, going on job interviews, one after the other, and I remember for months looking for a job, I, and I would get one of two responses. I was either told, well, you're not experienced enough because all you've done is gone to school and, and be a youth pastor. You know, I, well, I worked in a restaurant, but that didn't, I never, I didn't apply to any restaurants, you know, and then so you're, you're inexperienced, too inexperienced, or they would say the exact opposite. They'd say, well, you're too, you're, you're too you're educated because I had a master's degree. And they would say, well, you're not going to want to sit here and, you know, work for this, this, you know, work in this office with your master's degree. You're going to like dump us the first chance, you know, and so, I, I couldn't get a job, and it was very frustrating. And I know I remember wondering, what have I done? My well-planned out life was not turning out the way I thought it would turn out. I remember one day, you know, I think it was in between job interviews, and I was down by the, down in Newport Beach, and I was so depressed. I went out onto the uh, on onto the jetty at Newport Beach. And I went out, I'm, off, I'm dressed for the next interview, you know, the tie and all that kind of stuff. And I'm sitting there on the rocks just complaining and moping to God, saying, did you, did you forget me? What, what's, what is this, you know? I remember writing a song at the time, I called it uh, uh, Wandering in the Wilderness Blues. You know, I just, I just, I just like, this sucks, this is terrible, have you forgotten me? And I'm sitting there on the rocks, not even paying attention, and a big old giant wave. <laughs> comes up and crashes against the rock. Boosh, water spraying everywhere. And I got soaked. And I felt like God was saying, you idiot, get over yourself. I'm going to take care of you, you know. And I felt like God was just kind of lovingly giving me a nudge that he's going to take care of us. Um, I eventually got a job at the Bank of Newport as a teller trainee, whop, earning a whopping $800 a month as a teller trainee. Worked there for two and a half years. Worked at McDonnell Douglas for a year. Um, work, eventually got on staff at Calvary Anaheim. But it would be 10 years after that before the thing happened, which is you, Calvary Fullerton. Because I always felt that God called me to be a, a senior pastor. It took time. It took time. I was not forgotten. God hasn't forgotten you. You think, oh, you're the pastor. Of course God hasn't forgotten you. <laughs> I was an idiot back then. God hadn't forgotten me. He has not forgot. He has not. Maurice, he has not forgotten you. A few years back, seven or eight years ago, I was sitting in my office over here. And like always, I was struggling and depressed about things that were going on. I can't remember what, I, I remember the situation, but something was going on in the church, and I, I, was, I was upset, and I was just bummed out. And Lori, my, my, my secretary, hands me a, a, a phone message thing. Somebody wants me to call him, and, and I'm thinking, oh boy, you know, I don't think I want to talk to anybody. And, but Lori's always good at nudging me to make sure that I return my phone calls, you know. And so I called this guy, he's named Chris from... Calvary Chapel, Boyden Beach in Florida. And I call the guy, and I've never never met the guy, don't know the guy, still don't know the guy. And he said that he had been praying and that my name, my name came to his mind and that God told him to be praying for me. 
He didn't ask me for anything. He didn't ask me to vote for somebody. He didn't ask me to try to sell me something. He just told me that God wanted him to be praying for me. And I tell you, the thing that hit me was not that my name, that Chris knew my name, but that God knew my name. He knows your name. He has not. He has not forgotten you. He has not. He has not. He has not forgotten you. He has not. He has not forgotten you. He said, verse 7, But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, I've always been, I've always found this quite amazing. Why would the God of the universe be interested in how many hairs I got on my head? But somehow he is. He is interested in the smallest details of my life. Now, obviously, it's easier to count hairs on some people's heads than it is on others. Um... But do you know, even bald guys used to have hair. You know, Greg Laurie, here's, here's, I'll prove, there's Greg Laurie. This is back in the day. Greg, we'll talk about, you know, he used to have long hair, beautiful long hair. Well, he did. I remember you going down to Monday nights when he used to teach Monday nights, and he would wear these football jerseys, and he had hair down his, down his back, you know. Um, but whether you have a little bit of hair or lots of, lots of hair, God knows all about you. He knows all about you. And he says that you are of more value than many sparrows. Now, how do we know that God values sparrows? We know because he takes care of them. We know, and I'll show you that in a minute, but we know because he takes care of them. Now, a few weeks ago, I began noticing, we have this, um, we have this wind chime outside of, our, um, outside of our kitchen window. And it's, I mean, we've only hung it up about a year ago, and it's, it's got this little, little uh, copper wire framed ball with, um, and, the, and it hangs down, it's got these, these little pipes, chimes, you know, and so when it wind blows, you know, you can hear, it has this little tinkling sound. It's very cool, very, very neat thing, right outside of the kitchen window. And a couple of weeks ago, I've been noticing, I noticed this strange thing that a hummingbird, we get hummingbirds in our backyard, and, um, and this hummingbird kept hanging out on the wind chime, and would fly, would zip all over the yard, and then would land on top of this little teeny ball, and 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 on the wire frame, and it would, and it would land on the, and, and it was hang, it was like perching there, and then it was like plucking plucking at its chest. I was wondering what this what's this guy doing, you know, and and I was wondering what's this what's this boy plucking all these feathers out, you know, and then he would take the feathers. It was fascinating watching. I was watching him through the blinds, because he otherwise he'd fly off. And I'm watching him, and he's like weaving the the uh, the feathers around the wires of this thing. It's like, wow, this thing is really nuts. This bird's really wacko. Eventually, I realized that the he was not a he, it was a she, and she was building a nest. Um, and the other day, she was off flying around. I didn't scare her off to do this. I just want to let you know, I was, I was I've been good to her. And, but she was off flying around, and I snuck outside and took a picture of what was inside. Oh, oh, here we go. Here's the picture of what's inside. Look at that. Isn't that cool? Now, don't get, don't get, don't get surprised by the size of this, because the nest is like this big. So these are itty bitty, teeny tiny little eggs. I even checked. I even got a picture from this morning. Um, they're st- the eggs, the eggs are still there because she was off getting breakfast or something, you know. And <laughs> And now that she's laid the egg, she spends a whole lot more time on the nest than she did before. Because before she was just happy-go-lucky, flying all over the place, and every you know every other day she'd you know weave a few more feathers in, you know, or something. And uh, now she spends almost a whole day on on these on these eggs. And I got to, I've been wondering, you know, should I do something for this bird? Should I should I like help it or something? You know, wh- wh- how, who's going to feed this bird? You know, what's going to happen? You know, and it dawned on me, God's going to do it. God knows how to take care of his birds, every single one. He knows how to do this. Even after the babies are born, I don't have to teach this bird to do nothing. God will take care of this. Jesus said, 
Oh, there she is on her nest. Can you see? Can you see her right there? There's her little beak and everything, you know. And you have to take the pictures through the blinds because, because if you go outside, oh, she's gone. If you open the blind, she's gone. You know, if you ha if you pull the blinds all the way up and just stand there, she won't she won't come. Yeah, so it, that's that's the best picture I've been able to get of her. Um, and um, and Jesus said, "Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap." nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? The correct answer to that question is, of course. You are way more valuable than they. And so Jesus says, do not fear, therefore. The last thing about fear I want to talk about is the fear of the future, because I think that's what he's addressing. And I think there's a lot of things we could address when it comes to our fear of the future. I'm just going to talk about two of them. The first is the fear of finances, because that's something I, you know, I worry about every once in a while, is what's going to happen, you know, and, and how are we going to pay our bills. And you, you probably never worry about that, I guess, right? You, you, that, this is, I picked the wrong subject, right? right? So you never, ever worry about that. Money is actually one of the top sources of conflict within marriages. Um, you know, Greg and Lauren, I'm sure that they'll, they will deal with that when they talk at their coupleship class. Um, I, I've watched them wrestle and figure this out. I found an excellent article on conflict in marriage, and this is what they say. Uh, and, and I've got links to this on, in my notes. If you go to the downloadable notes, the things I'm going to share with you are all in there. And, and, and they say this, allow us to say it straight. Money fights between couples are rarely about money. So if you want to minimize a currency conflict, trace it back to the fear, the fear that's fueling it. Instead of fighting over the amount of money that was spent on who knows what, shift the focus toward what really matters. And there's four things that they list. The first thing is this. Fo focus on your fear of not having influence in important issues impacting your life. Because that's what you're afraid of. You're afraid that you can't fix this, that you can't, you, you can't affect this decision. Number two is, is focus on your fear of not having security in your future. What's it going to be like 10 years from now? What's it going to be like when we retire? What's it going to be like, you know, if, if I get laid off? What, what's this going to be like? He said, they say to focus on your fear of having no respect shown for your values. Because see, that's some, sometimes that's the, that's, the, that's the real issue. It's not that he or she bought the thing that they bought, but that they didn't buy the thing that you would have spent the money on. But they don't value the things that you value. So you've got to talk about those things, what's behind it. And the fourth thing they say is to talk about your fear of not realizing your dreams. But, but... But, but I wanted to do this, and that's why I'm saving for this, is so we, we could do this, and, you, and you've taken this away. So they suggest talking about these things, and, and notice it's all about fear. Jesus says, don't fear. You're, you're more valuable than the sparrows. Don't fear. Address these issues with your spouse and get on the same page with your spouse. And while you're working on getting on the same page as your spouse, Make sure that you're on the same page with God when it comes to your finances. In other words, think about responsibility. Um, uh, learning to trust God about your finances doesn't mean that you, that you don't do your part like working. Um, 2 Thessalonians 3.10, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. We learned this the hard way in the, in the early days of our church. We had people in the church that, that weren't working, and they kept saying, well, we're just trusting God. We're just trusting God while they're asking everybody for handouts. And, and it finally, we just like dawned on us like, what a bunch of idiots. You're not trusting God. You're trusting everybody else. And you're taking advantage of everybody else. This is an important verse. If you are able to work, you should be working. You should work. You should be able to, in fact, Paul says in Ephesians 4, learn to work so that you can give to others. See, that's important that you do that. It's important that you learn contentment. Paul says, first, uh, says Philippians 4.11, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. 
I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. See, contentment's important because when I start looking what other people are doing and I want what they want, that gets me into trouble. When what I need to do is learn to be content with where I'm at, what has God provided for me right now, to learn to live on what God has provided for you and not, not think about what somebody else has. And the last thing is learn to, again, uh, trusting Him. You need to trust Him and you need to remember my hummingbird. God will take care. You do your part, He will do His part. Isaiah 12, 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. Now, fearing of the future one thing is finances. The last thing I want to talk about is direction for our lives. Because sometimes that's what I'm worried about. Did I make the right choices? Am I going in the right direction? My wife has this devotional that she reads every day. It's among many things that she reads. And it's called Streams in the Desert. Has anybody heard of the Streams in the Desert devotional? Wonderful, wonderful book. And just by coincidence... This is yesterday's devotion for streams in the desert. And it like was so fit my message today that I once again absconded from my wife's uh, treasure hunting. And I'm, so I'll get all the credit, even though she did all the work. And th- what I want to read you is based on Hebrews 11.8, where it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. That's an important verse to me personally. Um, 21, 22 years ago, when we decided to start the church, this was the verse that pushed us out the door because I had been thinking about starting the church. We had been making plans about starting the church, and Dave and Lori would remember. It was on Sunday nights. I was teaching through the book of Hebrews, and we were in chapter 11, and this was what hit us one Sunday, that verse And I felt convicted that here I am making a huge, important step that will affect lots of people, and I wasn't doing it in faith. And so we made a choice that Sunday when we taught on that verse that we would step out, even though all the pieces weren't in place, that we would learn to be like Abraham and step out even though we don't know exactly where we're going. We would learn to step out. Sometimes we have to step out in faith like Abraham even though we don't know what's up ahead. Now, I have two readings I want to read you. That was, this was what was in the, the, the devotional. F.B. Meyer, he's a pastor from the 1800s, he wrote this about this concept. And it's, kind of, it's kind of old English. Elizabeth, it's, it's Victorian English. So you'll have to kind of, kind of work on this, but, but try to follow this because it's good, good stuff. He wrote this. Oh, I wish I should... Oh, I should Read this with a British accent, I guess. Whither he went, he knew not. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, 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 no. I don't think I can do it through the whole thing. Whither he went, he knew not. It was enough for him to know that he went with God. Talking about Abraham, he leant not so much upon the promises, but upon the promiser. You get that? He looked not on the difficulties of his lot, but on the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God who had deigned to appoint his course and would certainly vindicate himself. O glorious faith, this is thy work. These are thy possibilities. Contentment to sail with sealed orders. In other words, the the officer has given you the orders and and told you where to go, but not told you why. To sail with sealed orders because of unwavering confidence in the wisdom of the Lord High Admiral. Willinghood to rise up, leave all, and follow Christ because of the glad assurance that earth's best cannot bear comparison with heaven's least. That earth's best cannot bear comparison with heaven's least. Now, the gal who writes uh, the, the book, uh, her name is, is L.B. Coleman. She was a, uh, uh, married to a missionary, 20 years on the missions field. This is what she wrote about this. This is pretty, pretty heavy stuff. It is by no means enough 
to set out cheerfully with your God on any venture of faith. Tear into small pieces any itinerary for the journey which your imagination may have drawn up. We were laughing first service because, you know, we had all my missions guys, you know, with, with, um, with Daniel and Manuel, and, and they know this. You go out to serve on a, on, a, on a mission trip, forget what you're planning on doing, right, Olivia? Forget what the plans are because all that's going to go right out the window. You know, at first you hit, as soon as you hit the airport, it all goes out the window. You just have to do what God eventually ends up leading you to do. Then she says, nothing will fall out as you expect. So you plan out every detail. Oh, you'll be disappointed. Because God doesn't always meet your expectations. Your guide will keep to no beaten path. He will lead you by a way such as you never dreamed your eyes would look upon. He knows no fear, and he expects you to fear nothing while he is with you. Is that good? Isn't that good? So don't be afraid of the future, because you, my friends, are quite valuable to God. You're quite valuable to him. Let's stand and pray. And so, Father, I I would like to pray here for a moment, Lord, for any of our friends with us who perhaps haven't taken that first step to trust you and to trust what you did on the cross to pay for their sin. Friend, if you were to die tonight, I know this is pretty depressing stuff, But if you were to die tonight, do you know where you would spend eternity? Would it be in heaven or would it be in hell? There are no other choices. God longs for you. God wants you to be in heaven with him. But you have to turn to him. You have to turn from your sin. And you need to open your heart and ask for God's help. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And if this is your prayer, if you pray this with me, I'm giving you the words, I'm helping you with the words of what you can say to God to start your way to heaven. Just say to God something like this. You can pray out loud with me if you want. Dear God, I need you. And I understand that my sins will take me to hell. And so I make a choice today. I choose to turn from my sin. And I choose to trust you. Will you forgive me? Will you pay the price for my sin? Jesus, will you come into my life? Would you help me to follow you? Because I need you so much. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name.